Life Issues on UCB1. Do you struggle with the relentless demands of modern life? Do you dream of pressing pause, stepping off the busyness treadmill and finding a simpler way to live? But the responsibilities that you carry mean that is not an option. How do we flourish in a hectic world? And is there a way of living that not only benefits us, but also positively impacts those around us and the communities that we live in? Well, my guest for this week's Life Issues podcast has been grappling with some of these questions. Uh, Catherine Hill is an author, broadcaster and UK director for Care for the Family. Welcome along to the UCB Life Issues podcast, Catherine. Helen, it's great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. Well, this conversation has been triggered by a book that you've written called Born Free. Let's start with that title. Where does that come from? Okay, so two little stories, really, that explain it. So um, to start with, it began with a question and um, a question from a friend. And I thought it was a bit of a silly question at the time. (laughs) She asked me what animal I was. And uh, I thought and I remembered that we'd recently been to Bristol Zoo and seen these little ants walking along with these huge, huge leaves on their backs, about 50 times their body weight. And and, uh, and I'm quite small and I've got a big capacity. And so I thought, yeah, I'm an ant. I remember that Book of Proverbs, you know, talks about commends the ant for her industry. But then she followed it up with another question, um, which took me a bit unawares. And she said, if you could be any animal what animal would you like to be and that's when my mind took me to a trip we'd made to South Africa to deliver some parenting seminars for care for the family and I remembered seeing the lioness um, under the tree uh, just uh, with her her little cubs around her scanning the horizon um, not not being lazy but what I called active stillness so she was fully alert waiting for that moment to go um but she wasn't she wasn't at rest but she yeah she was she was there (laughs) and uh, at the ready and I thought that's how I want to live and I thought yeah I'm a lioness and then I had begun thinking about this whole subject of of rhythms of life that I guess we'll explore and my publisher Stephanie said to me why don't you read the book Born Free it's a I imagine many of the listeners may remember the original book, Born Free, about the little lioness, uh, Elsa, who is brought up in captivity and then uh, she's released into the wild. And she said, if you read it, you might just find descriptions of a lioness if you want to write about that in this book. So I got hold of an old copy and I was amazed. Um, First of all, on the front cover, it says a lioness of two worlds. And I thought as Christians, that's that describes us. We live in this world, but we have our sights on um, another world, the kingdom of heaven. But then, and this was the crux of it, I opened the uh, first chapter and it's not a book about faith. It's a book about the diaries of the people who brought up this little lioness. Um, but there was a verse uh, from the book of Acts and Paul is in prison and a centurion is guarding him and the centurion says to Paul um he says uh, how did you get your freedom mine came at a great price and Paul says I was born free and so that's why I use the title for the book to look at how can we how can we live out of that place of freedom um that attentive stillness of the lioness and I kind of draw on Mm. um little uh parts of of descriptions of the lioness through the book um but it's very much about how how we can live in a busy world with that what the bible calls the unforced rhythm of grace i love the unforced rhythm of grace uh, it is the message version isn't it of the words of jesus recorded in the book of matthew that we can we can receive when we follow Jesus. And I know that will come up more as we continue this conversation. But I want to go back to that word you mentioned. The shortened version is free, but comes from freedom. And I think in our world that we live in, certainly in the Western world, we think of freedom being able to do whatever I want. But actually, many of us, we don't live a life often that is free. We carry so many responsibilities. 
Mm. Busyness is a label that we wear often with pride. You know, I know how many conversations, I'm sure you have the same, Catherine, when you ask someone, how are they? And they respond, busy. And we can all feel like it's just me, but the one day it's going to change. One day I'm going to learn to live in that kind of more active stillness that you talked about or just being more present. But actually, many of us are really struggling with this understanding that we are born free. Um, And I suppose, do you think that we don't always realise that we have choices um, that we can make in our lives that affect how we live in that freedom? I think that's absolutely right. I In the book, I look at uh, a few different things, but... um, probably four different things that I think, for me anyway, get in the way of me really living from that place of freedom. And you just touched on one, which is busyness, Um, striving, thinking it's all about me and my effort at the digital age, which I think is a big one, the distraction of our phones, and then just the circumstance of life. You know, at Care for the Family, we hear time and again, the most um, testing uh, of times coming to families and knocking us sideways and how we keep going um, and live from that place of freedom, even when circumstances around us are tough. Now, I imagine that's not a definitive list and other people will have other things that get in the way. But certainly for me, those four I think, are, are the ones that I'm most aware of um, in my everyday life. You mentioned about looking at the ants on that trip to the zoo that kind of made you think about the animal that you are. And as you say, it's mentioned in the Bible many times, actually, to go and look at the ants. What do you think they can teach us about how to live as humans? Yeah, there is so much good about the ant. I think I just, when I was thinking about, do I want to be an ant or something else? I thought, oh, they're silly little creatures. I don't want to be an ant. I'm a lioness sounds much more exciting. But do you know there's some amazing qualities of the ant? I mean, the, the Bible, the book of Proverbs says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. And I think the industry of the ant, the hard work, Um, There's a whole chapter in my book about work because I I think it's not, we talk a lot about rest at the moment, but I think it's the balance between work and rest that we need to focus on. And work is really good. Um, God put Adam and Eve in the garden um, to work it and to toil. So I think the ants work together as well. And um, a big part of what I write about and what I passionately believe is that we don't do the Christian journey on our own. We do it with others. And if we can learn to work together, which ants do, um, then again, um, I think we find we find a freedom in that mm. um, learning to work to our, our gifts. So um, and I think they are being ants. We we want to we want to be who God made us to be. We want to uh, live it within our personality, not put on in the, in the Bible, the story of David and Goliath. And King Saul um, gives David his armor to wear to kill the giant Goliath and it's too big and it doesn't fit him. And he says, I can't wear this. And he, he goes and picks up the five stones from the brook. And I think sometimes we can try and be like other people and not recognize the incredibly unique way God has made us. And I think ants do that. They know what they're good at and they do it with all their might. So there is some good stuff with ants. (laughs) I want to pick up uh, in a moment on that balance between work and rest. Um, But You mentioned some of the areas that get in the way of us living in the freedom that we have been created for. Busyness, striving, distractions and our circumstances. Picking up on one of those, and I know that you do a lot of work with this, uh, with care for the family. Distraction is such a huge issue in our society. There are so many devices in our homes so many voices vying for our attention. But often we don't even realise that we're even being distracted. And I suppose... Talk to us about how we can balance or deal with distractions because they are part of life and they're not always a negative thing, but I suppose it's about owning them rather than them owning us. Yeah, so I think there's there's two parts to that. So firstly, the distraction of the digital age. Um, yeah, you're right. We work a lot with parents at Care for the Family on this. I've written a book called Left to Their Own Devices, Confident Parenting in an Age of Screens. And that little device in our pocket uh, is a, it's certainly for me, it's a distraction. I'm often disappointed with myself with how often, you know, I'm waiting in the coffee queue um, and my hand just goes straight to my phone. And I 
I haven't got anything urgent to check. I'm just looking at Instagram or deleting emails or whatever. And I think um, there's something called the attention economy. And the, the biggest commodity is no longer gold or oil or precious metals. It's our attention. And the, the tech, the big tech companies are doing everything to get our attention. All those little devices, if you think about it, on our phones, so notifications, um, the the tick that changes color, the three little dots that sort of invite us in, um, and the whole thing called the slot machine effect, which is uh, anticipation and reward. So we anticipate that next like, and then we get the reward of it, and then we go back again. That's the same thing happens in our brains as happens when people uh, feed money into slot machines. So there's it, we're not on a level playing field here. It's it's hard, but actually we can. There's loads of things we can do to. Um, help manage uh keep the i think it's often called parent your phone in the same way you if you were a parent you you decide when your children go to bed and when they get up and what they do we can do the same mm. with our phones but equally there's loads of ways they can help us in our devotional life as well so it's not all bad um but i think if i had one one tip out of all the things we could say about technology it would be don't sleep with your phone by your bed you know, if the last thing that we see when we go to sleep is our Instagram feed and the first thing we see when we wake up in the morning is BBC News, then actually we're not filling our mind with the things that we could be filling it with. Mm. Um, not that there's anything wrong with those things, but just top and tailing the day, um, reading a Bible verse or praying or just being still with God is is a much healthier thing to do. Mm. So, um, so the digital age, but then... I don't know if you, Helen, if you are talking about the interruptions of life. Yeah, just picking up on that, I, I think we were talking about choices and being aware that actually I have a choice. And I remember speaking to you a few years back, actually, and what you said, I was uh, using my phone for my alarm clock. So it was kind of the excuse I had. And then that was then why the last thing looking at at night would be my phone, because it was the thing that I was using for my alarm clock. And actually your challenge encouraged me to buy an alarm clock and not use that as an excuse. And it has changed my life. And it's, as we were talking about choices, we all have choices we can make that affect how we live and how we feel. Um, but speaking of distractions, something that I'm learning, and this is from living with my sister, um, Catherine, and bear with me as I share a little story. She's someone that loves to externally process in the evenings. Whereas for me, that's when I'm done. Like I've used all my words up for the day. I just want to chill. However, I'm the morning person. I'm up at the crack of dawn. I'll be chatting away then when she's a bit slower in the mornings. And I've had to learn that in my evening routine, she wants to chat and I've not always given her that time because for me, I've got my to-do list and I haven't factored in that interruption. And I don't want to call my sister an interruption because it's it's a good relationship. But what I mean is, as I've been learning this um, rhythm of life, living with my sister, I've learned that actually I've got to factor into my day to be distracted, to be interrupted. And actually, it's really helped because <laughs> I suppose we don't always see that we have that option. We can get frustrated by things that we're not deciding. But actually, is that something that you've learned that we can actually allow for interruptions in our life and they can be a good thing? That has been, I think, for me, one of the key lessons. A lot of this I learned, um, I, well, it's been a long, long journey, but there was a key moment in COVID when I turned over the calendar and realised in lockdown that, that there wasn't anything written. There were 30 blank squares looking at me rather than a whole list of to, things that I was I needed to be doing. And that allowed me to have time and space to think about living at a different pace. And then prompted me really to think, how can we live like that when the diary fills up again? Uh, so and that's what really the book is about. And this business of leaving margin in our lives and space for interruptions. That's played a big part. So if you think about Jesus, uh, he so often did one of his miracles as as a result of an interruption. So he's on his way to Jairus' house and he's interrupted by the woman who's been bleeding and he stops and he heals her. Or he's on his way to the Passover and blind Bartimaeus shouts out and he stops and he heals him. Or, or he's doing a you know, a really great, giving a really great sermon and some people um, lower their friend in through the roof and he stops what he's doing and and heals him, tells him his sins are forgiven. So, so often Jesus managed to, he just lived in a way where he was interruptible. And 
I know that I struggle with that. Similarly to the story you just shared, Helen, I, I remember a friend ringing me and asking for a lift to the garage and she really needed it. And I had got something else planned. And I remember feeling just irritated and it wasn't, there was, I didn't like it that I felt like that. Yeah. I wanted to have a really loving response to her and drop everything and, and go. So I think one of the things we can do to help us be interruptible is to build margin in our lives. So at Care for the Family, we have a little mantra when we go to London that we get the train before the train that will get them there, us there on time. And that has meant that I've spent a lot of time sitting in coffee shops, but it's also meant that when the trains are cancelled, when um, there's a traffic jam on the way to the station, when all kinds of other delays happen, I'm not up against it. And um, it's like the margin for error that statisticians put into their calculations, uh, put in a margin for errors that doesn't affect the final result. And I think if we can build margin in our day, it's much easier to respond to the things that God is doing. And sometimes he works through those interruptions. So I love um, thinking of the story of Moses when he was looking after the sheep and he goes to Horeb and he sees the bush burning. And it's as he notices it and as he walks towards the bush that the Bible says God speaks to him from the from the flames of fire. And I was reflecting if he'd been on his phone, if he'd you know just been too busy to look up, he'd have missed it. Mm. And that links with the lioness and the and she's looking to the horizon. And I think it's that slower pace and that margin that makes us interruptible, not just to other people, but to what God is doing as well oh, in yeah. our lives and helping us be on the front foot with that. And how many of us who do have a relationship with Jesus as Christians think, oh, God's not talking to me. I can't hear God. But actually, it's because we filled our lives to the brim. It's so loud. It's so busy. We just can't hear God in, in the pace of life that we're living. Um I would think it's really interesting, the building margins into your day. I think that works. And this is a slightly different point. But uh, just a side note, financially, if you're saving, if you're able to, just to put that little bit more aside for the margins of life. I actually have a little squirrel account, I call it, uh, which is for rainy days when things happen, like your car breaks down or, you know, you've got a leaky roof and you've not planned for it. So if you put that kind of margin aside, then it's not something that is such a shock and can be you know, it can uh, end up being a detrimental impact to your finances. But that's a separate issue. Um, I do want to pick up on what you mentioned around um, rest, that balance between work and rest. I know for many of us, we can struggle. We either don't rest, but also there are those of us who are doers, who when we actually have rest, we get a bit antsy, a bit like, ah, oh, I can't be still. So talk to us about what you've learned about living rhythms of life that you talked about quite beautifully at the beginning and what it looks like to find that balance between work and rest? Well, I think certainly before I worked for Care for the Family, I was a family lawyer and there was a lot of talk then about work-life balance as if you could live in this place where a bit like on a tightrope when you always had everything in balance. And I think over the years I've come to discover for me that it doesn't work like that. And sometimes there's a crisis in the workplace and you have to down tools and you have to work late and you have to, you know, put all your energies into that. But then something can happen at home and the same thing has to happen. We put all our energies into the workplace. So I think it's not a question. It's a tension we have to manage. Mm. Um, but there's a lovely, I came across this lovely Italian phrase called tempo giusto. And it basically means the right, the right, tempo the right speed for the right task so sometimes we do have to do things quickly and we do need to be busy but what when we go wrong is it is when that busyness and that hurry enters our soul and becomes our identity and we do everything in a hurry even our relationships so I think that was just a few reflections really on the on the busyness side but I think with rest understand for me understanding that there are different types of things that drain us. So it might be mental, it could be physical, it could be social, it could be emotional, and it could be spiritual. And just recognizing 
And each of us will be different in that, our personality. Someone who's an introvert who's had to spend a lot of time with people will will need some time on their own. That will be their rest. Mm. Whereas an extrovert, maybe who's had to be on their own, for them, rest will look like going out with some friends for a coffee or um, seeing people. So I think some of this is knowing ourselves and knowing what are the things that bring us joy, that bring us rest, and where are the areas in our life that are work? And it's not just the paid work that we do. There'll be other things that drain us. And then how can we really intentionally um, put those things in place so that so that we don't burn out yeah. and so that we can um, live from that place of rest? And I was thinking, again, from my own perspective, there are people like me who love being busy, you know, I don't want to miss out on life. I've got so many plans that I can think about and I'm constantly thinking of new things that I want to do. And it's all about planning, you know, the future. But I know that sometimes I can then miss out on this moment. There'll never be another day like this ever again. This is it, you know, that you may have another day tomorrow, but this is the only day that we know we're going to have. So how do we, as people who do and love making plans and get excited for the future, how do we deal with that excitement and the good that comes with that, but also be present and not rush ahead of ourselves? Yeah, I think um, taking the moment intentionally to notice what's happening in the present is a good practice. Um, Even just pausing and thinking, oh, wow, look at those clouds or um, look at that uh, lovely, you know, face of that older lady sitting on that bench or whatever it is. Um, Just taking time to see and to hear um, what's going on around us and often to be grateful. I think if we're grateful, um, thankfulness brings us to the moment, I think. But it's good to plan as well. And it is good to 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 look ahead um but just so that that doesn't take over i think and like you've said it doesn't rob us Mm. um of the of the present moment Mm. i want to pick up on something you mentioned that i have felt a lot actually and i think it comes around the striving um issue you mentioned and that can be that our lives can feel really full action-packed hectic and we're striving for something, but we can feel like something's missing out. I call it square peg round hole syndrome sometimes, actually, where you just think isn't quite fitting. What is that? And why do you think we have it? I think hopefully less now, but certainly my character is one who wants to, uh, someone who wants to achieve, someone who, who wants to strive. I tell a story in the book about um, I actually went to boarding school when I was 10 and the first day of boarding school I always remember the first night lying in the darkness and just wondering what the next day would bring and this uh, matron put her head around the door and she said uh, oh Sarah in the next door room's crying because she's missing home can anyone lend her a teddy bear and I had my teddy bear my much loved teddy bear and I remember in that moment didn't take me long giving her that teddy bear and but actually something much deeper happened then because in that moment I decided that I would never be the vulnerable person who needed a teddy bear I would never be the one to admit um that I was missing home um I would be the one that would be successful and would um you know prove my own worth really and maybe as a way to navigate boarding school that wasn't a bad plan but it certainly was not a good plan to live like that in my 20s 30s 40s yeah i remember when i was a lawyer staying up to the early hours preparing my case for the next day just so it could be perfect or uh, when i was a young mum um making world book day costumes or birthday cakes till the small hours of the morning <laughs> so they were all fantastic or even more ironic, probably, um, making sure that I set my alarm and did my morning quiet time um, properly. So that box was ticked. And and I think if we live like that, um, we're, we're almost feeling like we're in control. And, you know, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God, not you. Mm. And present world circumstance and COVID, I think, have shown us like nothing else before that we're not in control of our lives. And it's exhausting living in a way that's always striving. Um, And so if we can step back and allow God to shape us and change us, because it's his work in us, we just put ourselves like the caterpillar in the cocoon. He has to just get himself in that cocoon and then 
he becomes a butterfly. And I think if, and I talk quite a bit in the book, really practical ways, how can we get ourselves into God's presence so that he can work in our lives and do that incredible work of transformation in us? So it's not all on our shoulders. Mm. In your book, what I really enjoy that I think it's something that would be beneficial in more books, if I'm honest, is that at the end of each chapter, you ask a couple of questions. And I, you mentioned this at the beginning or earlier on in this conversation about giving yourself time to think about life, how I would like to see my life improve if we're living like we've been talking about, life's just running out of control. How are questions helpful? Why have you done that? Why have you allowed these questions to be part rather than just... Because you've got, you've got so much wisdom and knowledge, Catherine. You know, I'm sure most people just think, well, you just tell me the answer. But why have you put these <laughs> questions in? I think there's something about pausing and actually applying some of the principles to our own lives that's really important. Uh, I'm one for just reading through books and sometimes you know not pausing enough and really stopping to think or to journal or whatever or talk with somebody else about well what does that mean for me and at the first chapter of the book I talk about um how I talk about a, an accident I had when I broke my pelvis and how I had time to think and someone contacted me just this week and they just bought the book and opened it and they had had a big knee operation and meant that they couldn't they couldn't move at all for um, quite a few days um, and they said oh my goodness just that question was brilliant because it, it it applied to me and then I could think okay well what am I gonna how am I gonna learn what am I going to use this time for and um, this enforced time of having to be still and so that was my prayer really that those questions will spark off. Not every question will be right for every single person, but maybe for people on their own, but also maybe just with friends or in small groups, just chatting through how how those things apply to us. Because it's when we start to put those little changes in place mm. that I think transformation happens, kind of moves from our head to our heart. Yeah, it's the action, isn't it? Well, the book is called Born Free, A Call to Be Still, No God and Flourish in a Hectic World, uh, written by my guest this week, Catherine Hill. Um, sticking with that idea of asking questions, you know, creating margins of time in our lives, thinking about how we can create more beneficial routines. Do you think then we have to almost do more to create less, like put in place these practical things we can do like planning our time kind of not letting time just run away from us it takes effort right the short-term pain for the long-term gain so the monks used to have uh something called a rule of life and it doesn't mean rule like a list of rules it's rule like it like your ruler in your pencil case but it's a set of principles and the word actually comes from the word for a trellis so the support structure that enables a plant to grow and so in the same way, I think we can have some rhythms and routines in our lives that will enable us to grow um, in our relationship with God, our love for God to grow, our love for others to grow as well. Um, but I do think we have to be intentional and we do have to, to plan. But it's not about adding more stuff in. It's probably about taking some stuff away, but then putting some simple routines in place. So I love something that the pastor Rick Warren um, from uh, America, he, he's got this lovely turn of phrase and he encourages people to um, divert daily, withdraw weekly and abandon annually. So just mm -hmm. finding that time every day when we can just divert our thoughts to God's presence. In the Bible, so often it talks about people praying three times a day. So um, in uh, the Psalms or Daniel or in the early church. And, you know, that's I found that's a way that works for me. Just really, really short and simple. So something in the morning and then I just set an alarm for lunchtime and try and remember to say the Lord's Prayer. And again, something in the evening that just enables that rhythm of turning our hearts to God. And then um, the withdrawing weekly, the Sabbath, what, you know, how do we mm. practice that seventh day that for us looks like rest? There's probably a whole book, new book on that. <laughs> um, and then abandon annually. 
Um, so what does that look like? Maybe it's going off to a festival or finding some some way of um, once a year at uh, some kind of retreat. And maybe because of caring responsibilities, maybe um, someone's a single parent, caring for elderly relatives or whatever, just going away anywhere isn't possible. But there are ways we can do that at home. Um, just ignoring all the tasks, maybe doing something online, um, but just different ways, being creative mm. as to those rhythms in our lives. Giving yourself permission. It's so important, isn't it? I, I remember having some um, counselling, actually, and um, it was around the idea of basically rules that I was creating. I can't remember what, exactly what I was thinking. and But I, anyway, I had this idea. It was a negative idea about myself. And the counsellor said, who's decided that? And I realised it was me. I was telling myself that. So it was learning to kind of do the opposite, which is a bit like what you're sharing, like giving yourself permission to, as you say, divert daily or as Pastor Rick Warren says, withdraw weekly and abandon annually. But you can think, oh, no, but I can't do that. I can't. I couldn't. Well, who says you can't? You're saying you can't. Well, change that. You're the one that can give yourself permission to do that. Um, But it does take effort. It does take sacrifice. And there's something that I found interesting in your book uh, when it comes to around how we then go about flourishing in a hectic world and how we start to make steps in our lives. And I know you've given us loads of practical um, advice already, but you talk about five spheres where we can invest our energy and almost by categorising where we put our energy, it can help us with our decision making and where we do invest our time. Yeah, so the mental, the social, um, the emotional, the spiritual and the physical. And I think, it, yeah, it's worth just looking at our lives and and thinking, well, what are the things that, because there'll be different things that are a drain for each of us because of how uniquely we're made. And uh, so for some people, um, hosting people in their home is really easy and that's not a drain. But for others, that might be quite quite costly for them and so just working out what are the things that are work what are the things that drain us what are the things that then bring life and intentionally putting them in place there's a a really lovely story of uh, that I share in the book of a, a grandfather and um, he is talking to his little grandson and he says inside me are two wolves one is full of hate and malice and greed And the other is full of love and joy and peace and kindness. And they're fighting. And sometimes the fight is furious. And the little boy looks at his grandpa and he says, Grandpa, which one wins? And the grandpa pulls the the little boy close and uh, he whispers in his ear, the one I feed. And I love that because it's the things that we pay attention to, the things that we love, the things that we invest our time in that shape the people that we're becoming and and we can do that um we have we can start small and just invest in those things that are life-giving for us and that will change the people that we are what am i feeding so good um something that you talk about in the book that i think does make sense to a lot of us when we give ourselves chance to think about it is that we are not created to do life alone and this isn't about introverts and extroverts this is about community so talk to us about when we're thinking when we're looking at how we do flourish in a hectic world why it's important that we do this together invite people in not feel like it's just me struggling you know community it's so important so throughout the book I actually look at different qualities of the lioness and sort of weave those in. And I love this chapter that I that uh, is the one about community because I discovered that the lioness, lions are the only uh, cats that live in community. And um, the, the lionesses will have their cubs at the same time so that other lionesses can look after them when they go out hunting. And oh, it's just amazing um, how nature has reflected how God has created us to be. So he is he is relational, you know, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They're in relationship together, relationships at the center of the universe. And he's created us for relationship as well. And so being intentional about that. And uh, I have two, two women that I have prayed with now for 
over 30 years. So we started when our children were little and we prayed each other through the sleepless nights and the broken legs and the broken hearts and the um, leaving home and exams and um, looking after elderly parents, all the things of life. And that has been so important for me. And um, and I, I think it's been tough, really tough um, in terms of our church involvement since COVID. Uh, but actually the church community is where we can flourish where we can where we can help and, and be a part the bible talks about us being different parts of the body and we can we can play our part uh in that in 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 relationship um i think god has made us he calls he calls us to be a people mm. um not just not just individuals and society i think tells us that you know rugged individualism is the way forward and actually it's much more it's a much more beautiful way to live if we're living if we're living in community. Well, for more fascinating stories and wise advice, uh, the book is called Born Free, A Call to Be Still, No Guards and Flourish in a Hectic World. You can find it wherever you buy your books from, but uh, carefortheFamily.org.uk is where to go to find out more about the work Catherine's doing there and that book as well. But thank you so much for bringing your wisdom and uh, knowledge and experience to us here on the Life Issues podcast. Thanks, Helen. It's been great. 